Okay, we're in section three, chapter five. This is probably the most important section whole semester. So we may spend a little extra time. And the idea is solving trigonometric equations. So what is solving trigonometric equations? We've, we've solved algebraic equations. We've solved logarithmic exponential. So the whole idea is, you know, we know how to find the tangent of an angle. Um, we plug it in our calculator. <coughs> We also know how to take the inverse tangent of an angle, but that just gives us an answer between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So there are going to be more solutions to the question, this particular question. So if I said um, the tangent of x equals 2, what is x? So what angle in degrees or what angle in radians has a tangent whose value is 2? <clears throat> now, you might think, oh, i just take the inverse tangent of that. So if I take the inverse tangent of the tangent of, and then I take the inverse tangent of the other side, all I have to do is plug in the inverse tangent of negative 2, and that'll give me one answer, <clears throat> one solution. And again, depending upon whether you have your calculator in degrees or radians, you'll get a different answer. So let's let's just do it. You know, this will give us one answer. But typically, we we'll want to know what are the solutions between zero and two pi at least. And sometimes we want it for all values of x. Now we're not going to list every value of theta or x. So we're going to come up with an equation that that represents all those values. They're always they're they're basically multiples of 2 pi. So you get two solutions between 0 and 2 pi, and two solutions between 2 pi and 4 pi, and so forth and so on. Anyway, so I'm going to change my mode, my mode into degrees. Now, I know that this answer is going to be somewhere between 45 and 90, because the tangent of 45 degrees is 1, and then it gets bigger. So it's going to be bigger number than that. So if I do the inverse tangent of 2, I'll get 63.4 degrees. <clears throat> so x equals 63.4 degrees. And if I change the mode to radians, I'll take the inverse tangent of 2, and I'll get um, 1.107 radians. And remember, that the three ways are degrees, radians, and then we divide 1.107 by pi, and we get 0 0.3524 pi radians. And remember, in the first quadrant, you go from 0 to 90, or from 0 to pi over 2, which is a half. So this is between 0 and a half, so it makes sense. OK. So we need to solve for one trigonometric function or factor so that we have only one. Oh, OK. Yeah. So sometimes you to solve these, you might you might factor a polynomial version of a trigonometric function. We did that <coughs> in the previous section. So sometimes uh, we can get solutions from each one factor. Uh, you know, if I had something like two sine squared x um, minus sine x uh, minus 1 equals 0. And you're asked, what is the solution to this? You don't just have a simple tangent of x equals some number. So you, you could factor this into 2 sine x uh, plus 1 and the sine of x minus 1 equals 0. And so if you multiply this out, you'll get that. And so there's two solutions here, one associated with this factor and one associated with that factor. You set each one of those equal to 0 and solve for it. So that's that was just to remind me. So you know what, what kind of things are we going to be doing here? Ultimately, we need to get to something 
sine of x equals something, and cosine of x equals something, tangent of x equals something, and then figure out what that argument is. So uh, you might collect like terms in the original equation. You might take the square root of something. You factor. We just showed an example of factoring. You may use trigonometric identity just to rewrite one function in terms of another function. Uh, you might square it and convert it into some kind of quadratic type function that you can factor. <clears throat> you might have multiple angle solutions. What that means is instead of the tangent of x, you might have the tangent of 2x. And we're going to definitely be using the inverse function to solve these kinds of problems. So let's talk about solving these problems graphically first, and then we'll talk about how to do them analytically. So you can use a graphing program to, to come up with at least an idea of what the solutions are. But first, I'm going to, to use something that's not involving trig functions to demonstrate the process. <clears throat> so here we have a quadratic equation, and it's equal to 0. And so we do, we could factor it to find the solutions. But the other thing we could do <clears throat> is we could take the part that involves the variable, put that on one side, the part that involves the constant, put that on the other side, and then plot both sides as a function of, so we'd say y is equal to x squared plus 3x. That's going to give us a parabola and y equals 4. And the intersection of these two curves y equals x squared plus 3x, and the curve y equals 4 are the solutions. So if we go down here and look, we'd say one solution is x equals negative 4, and the other solution is x equals 1. And if we just took the original equation and factored it, we'd get this. And the solutions would be x equals negative 4. That's when this factor goes to 0 and x equals 1, which makes that factor. So those are the two solutions analytically. You can do the same thing graphically. <clears throat> so if I said solve the equation 2x, 2 cosine x plus 1 equals 0, or if I solve for the cosine of x, I get the cosine of x equals negative 1 half. So what are the values that make this function correct. Now, over here we just we had two values of x which satisfied the equation, but it turns out that if you plot this function, the cosine of x, and you look for points where the cosine is negative one-half, uh, you'll find out there are a lot. There's two between zero and two pi, and there's an infinite number. So here is well, there's two ways of looking at it. One is to look at it from a unit circle standpoint. And that would give you the two solutions between 0 and 2 pi. Now, if you're outside of 0 to 2 pi, then another method is better. So what we do is we say, OK, what values on the unit circle are such that the x-coordinate, which is, represents the cosine, where the x-coordinate is negative 1 half? So here is a unit circle. You'll find out if you look at your unit circle that the angle 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3 both have an x coordinate of negative 1 half. And those are two solutions, or 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. Now, if these angles are not your standard angles on a unit circle, then the unit circle doesn't really help you help you a lot. Now, to find all solutions, meaning the solutions that go from negative infinity to positive infinity, you do this procedure. You take your solutions between 0 and 2 pi, which are this, and you add n, which is a counter, times 2 pi. So every 2 pi, you get another solution. And basically what we're doing here, when we add 2 pi, is we're going one full rotation. And that's and that we're back to the same position. We go another 2 pi, we get back to the same position. Every time we loop around, we're incrementing n. Now, if you go the negative way, so let's say we start at 2 pi over 3, and we go negative 2 pi, we'll end up 
with some negative quantity. That's what the negative counter values mean. And so this thing actually goes from, it goes dot, 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 negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. This is just to show you the set of numbers that n takes on. So we took our second quadrant solution, added n times 2 pi, and we took our third quadrant solution, added n plus 2 pi. And this is the way of representing all the solutions. And as long as the, the original function has just x or theta, then the solutions are 2 pi greater or 2 pi less in multiples. That gives you all the solutions. Now graphically, <coughs> so that was using the unit circle. <coughs> Another way to do it would be to plot the cosine function between 0 and 2 pi, which is one full which is the period of this function. So that's this side, cosine of x. And then we plot a line y equals a negative a half. That's, that's um, analogous to what we did over here. We plotted the line x squared plus 3x, and we plot the line y equals 4, and we found the intersection point. So here, we're doing the same thing. We're going to draw a horizontal line representing the right-hand side, the solution. And these points of intersection are the solutions. So we go from here back to there and there. The problem of course is that you know I'm getting numbers here, the decimals, and it's not obvious that this is 2 times pi over 3 and this is 4 times pi over 3. It kind of gives you an idea what's going on. You know this this part of the curve represents the first quadrant, this part involves the second quadrant, this one involves the third quadrant, this involves the fourth quadrant. And we're only plotting the cosine. You know, one advantage of the unit circle is you can see both functions and how they behave. When you plot them as a function of x, the cosine is a function of x, and the sine is a function of x. We can only look at one at a time. But as far as the solutions, it's it's where the horizontal line representing the right-hand side of the equation intersects the function that represents the right-hand left-hand side of the equation, which is the trig function. Okay. Now, the way that I'm going to teach you <coughs> to do it is this next way. So we still have the same situation. We have the cosine of some variable x equals some value, negative one half. So the first thing we're going to do is we are going to determine the interval, determine in the interval from 0 to 2 pi what the two solutions are. There's always two solutions because, well, except, say, for example, if the cosine of x was negative 1, then there'd be one solution, which would be pi. But otherwise, every other place, if you draw a horizontal line, you're going to intersect two spots on the curve anywhere. Now here, you're going to intersect 0, and you'd intersect 2 pi, but notice that the inequality doesn't include 2 pi. So when you when you end up to the basically coincident with the axes the position of the axes then you could get one solution where you have positive one and negative one now even when you have zero which is also corresponds to the axes you do get two solutions if you draw a horizontal line so you have to use you know, all students take calculus to figure out which quadrant the cosine is negative so we don't use the half, we just use the negative. What quadrant is the cosine negative? So all students take calculus. Cosine is positive in the first quadrant because they're all it's positive in the fourth quadrant because that's the C, and it's negative in the second and third quadrant. So as a consequence, the solutions I'm looking for are in the second and third quadrants, which we see is true here. And we also see is true on the unit circle. So those all agree. The next thing we do is we find the reference angle. Now the reference angle is always an angle that's in the first quadrant. It's always a first quadrant solution. It's going to be positive 
and it's going to be between 0 and pi over 2 or 0 and 90 degrees depending upon which units you're using for the angle. So to find the reference angle you take the inverse cosine so this is where you use your calculator inverse cosine of the absolute value of negative one-half so we always change this to the positive so it'll be positive one-half if it's positive it stays positive if it's negative it becomes positive so the reference angle is the inverse cosine of one-half positive one-half and if you plug that into your calculator in radians you get 1.047 radians now that number doesn't even after doing it many times it still doesn't jump out at me and say oh that's something or other so what I have to do is again multiply and divide by pi so I take 1.047 divide by pi you do that you get 0.333 ah yeah that's that's a third so it's going to be pi divided by 3. So that's the reference angle. Now, the next thing you do, once you've got the reference angle, then you go back and use the information from the first part, which tells you what quadrants it's in, to figure out what the actual angle solutions are. And let me just write those out for you again. So if you're in the first quadrant, your, your solution is your reference angle. Okay. I've used two ways of doing it, theta prime or three the reference. That's because in the first quadrant the reference angle and the angle are the same thing. You know, the nearest x-axis is a positive x-axis, but that's the way I normally define an angle anyway. Now in the second quadrant the solution is pi minus the reference angle or pi minus the reference angle or 180 degrees minus the reference angle so depending upon whether you're doing degrees or radians and that's because if we draw our second quadrant angle this is theta that's the angle relative to the positive x-axis the reference angle is with respect to the negative x-axis. So we know theta plus theta prime is going to be 180 degrees. So if we solve for theta, it's 180 minus theta prime or pi minus theta prime. The third quadrant solution is theta is equal to pi plus theta prime or pi plus reference theta or pi plus 180 degrees so here's my third quadrant solution so this is my angle theta my reference angle is this angle so you can see that 180 plus theta prime is theta so I go or it's pi plus theta prime equals theta theta pi plus theta prime gives me the total angle and then the fourth quadrant solution says that the fourth quadrant solution is 2 pi minus theta prime so again we're drawing a diagram here this is the fourth quadrant solution so this is my angle theta theta prime the reference angle goes to the positive x axis so you see theta plus theta prime equals 2 pi or theta equals 2 pi minus theta prime and again sometimes we use reference angle like that sometimes we use theta prime and if you use degrees it's 360 degrees minus the reference angle or theta prime okay so those are the equations you want to write those down so when we got here we from the first step we said that there are two solutions one in the second quadrant one in the third quadrant and that was because of the negative sign in front of the, the cosine so because of the second quadrant solution the second quadrant solution is pi minus the reference angle pi minus pi over three 
3 pi over 3 minus 1 pi over 3 is 2 pi over 3. Okay, so that's the solution. And uh, let's get rid of this one. And the third quadrant solution is pi plus the reference angle. Pi plus pi over 3. 3 pi over 3 plus 1 pi over 3 equals 4 pi over 3. So there are two solutions to this. <coughs> Theta equals negative 1 half. They're the second, third quadrant solutions, and there they are. Now you can always check your answers, just like you can always you can do that with algebra as well. So if I wanted to check my answer, all I do is say the cosine, what's the cosine of 2 pi over 3? It should be negative 1 half. Again, make sure that your calculator is in radians. And then we would just do the cosine of 2 times pi divided by 3, and we get negative 0.5, which is negative 1 half. So check. And if you plug in 4 pi over 3, cosine of 4 pi over 3, you get negative 1 half. <coughs> Now to get the solutions for all real numbers, we take the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, and we add n times 2 pi. And n is from the set of numbers that go from, not from negative infinity, because you don't never equal to negative infinity. But it's all the negative integers till 0, including 0. Then you go to 0, and then you do all the positive integers. The solutions between 0 and 2 pi are when n equals 0. So if you set n equal to 0, these terms drop out, and you just end up with back to the solutions. So that's pretty much it once you get to this point. Now, sometimes you've got to do a little manipulation to get to that point. There's also the question of what do you do with when you have the cosine of 2x. What will happen is if you have cosine of 2x, Instead of having two solutions from 0 to 2 pi, you have, um, you have four solutions. OK, so let's, here's an example where um, we've got, we've got, uh, the question is when does, what values of x does this function? is satisfied. And it's satisfied when the, the terms in the factors are 0. So you got, you got to factor it one more time. So you can see up here, basically, if you, if you think about it in terms of replacing tangent with x, if I had 3x squared minus 1 and x squared minus 3, what would be the solutions? Well, let's, let's do it so you'd have 3x and x. So that, that'll give you 3x squared. And uh, you need a negative 1 here. So that's going to be uh, actually, yeah, that actually does not work. So they have to be the same. These two things have to be the same to make it work out. So instead of 1 and 3, it's going to be the square root of 3x times the square root of 3x, OK? So if you multiply those two together, you'll get 3x squared. Square root of 3 times the square root of 3 is 3. And then you do minus 1 and plus 1. So you see the inner and outer cancel out, because we don't have an x term. And then negative 1 times positive 1 is that. So that one works out. So the solution would be, um, the solutions are when the factors go to 0. So you end up with uh, square root of 3x equals 1, x equals 1 divided by the square root of 3, or square root of 3 over 3. Okay, so that's this solution right there. You can do the same thing over here. Square root of 3x plus 1 equals 0. So you get the square root of 3x equals negative 1, x equals negative 1 divided by the square root of 3, which is negative the square root of 3 over 3. Okay, so those are um, those are not my solutions that we're just demonstrating. Now, the other two, x squared minus 3, there you'd have x and x, and you have plus or minus, 
and you'd have the square root of 3. So again, the inner and outer terms cancel out. And the first terms give you x squared, and the, the last terms give you 3. So from, from these two, you, you get x equals negative the square root of 3, and x equals the square root of 3, if I set these equal to 0 and solve them. So I've got, I've got four solutions here, x solutions. Now, what would happen is you'd end up with the same kind of thing here, except instead of x being equal to these, you'd have the tangent of x equals the square root of 3 over 3. The tangent of x equals negative the square root of 3 over 3. The tangent of x equals negative the square root of 3. And the tangent of x equals the square root of 3. Now, each one of these, there are two angles associated with it. And you know they're, they're going to be pi over 6 or pi over 3. And, um, but I'm going to show you how to do this, how to do this without having to use a unit circle. It's a little longer, but it, it's the method that applies to the most general case. So we're going to do the first one here, tangent of x equals the square root of 3 over 3. So the first step is to figure out which quadrants. So the quadrant, this is a quadrant question. And there's going to be two quadrants. So let's write this out. All students take calculus. Tangent. Tangent is positive in the first quadrant, positive in the third quadrant negative in the second third quadrants. So because this is positive, this is going to give you the quadrant 1 and quadrant 3. Likewise, so this is Q1 and Q3. This is negative, so that's going to be quadrant 2 and quadrant 4. You see the only difference is the sign. So in terms of calc doing the second part, So let's, let's uh, well, yeah, let's just do this. So we're going to calculate the reference angle. Uh, we we'll use prime. Theta prime is the inverse tangent of the absolute value of the square root of 3 over 3. It's already positive, so it's, it stays positive. And let's do it in radians. Let's check our mode here. Unless told otherwise, we're going to do it in radians. Inverse tangent of square root of 3 divided by 3, close parenthesis, and I get 0 0.5236 radians. But I need to take that number and divide by pi, multiply by pi. So if we divide 0.523 blah 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 by pi we get 0 0.166 pi or pi over 6. Okay, so that's the reference angle. And it's the reference angle for all of these solutions because they're both the square root of 3 over 3. So step 3 is to figure out what the solutions are. Right? So our, our quad, we've got four quadrants. The first two we're doing is quadrant one and three. Quadrant one, theta, the solution is, is the reference angle. So the first quadrant solution is pi over six. My third quadrant solution is pi plus theta prime. So I get pi plus pi over six so 6 pi over 6 plus 1 pi over 6 is 7 pi over 6. So that's my second quadrant solution. Now, um, so that this was for the tangent of x equals the square root of 3 over 3. If I do the tangent of x equals minus the square root of 3 over 3, 
that's going to be quadrant two and quadrant four. So my quadrant two solution is equal to pi minus the reference angle. So my solution is pi minus pi over six, which is six pi over six minus one pi over six, which is five pi over six. So that's my second quadrant solution. And then my fourth quadrant solution is two pi minus the reference angle. So I get two pi minus pi over six. Two pi in terms of six is 12. 12 pi over six minus one pi over six is 11 pi over six. So I get four solutions for the first two values. So I get these are my two solutions for first and third quadrants when the tangent is positive and the second and fourth quadrant solutions when the tangent is negative. So I'm going to put these all down. So we're going to have here are all the solutions. We're going to have pi over 6, um, 7 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6. Okay. So that is the first bunch. And we'll come down. We'll do the rest of them now. And we'll write them all down. So the next, next part, if you remember, was this one. Tangent is negative to the square root of 3. Tangent is positive to the square root of 3. And, and the quadrant things still apply. So when it's positive, like in this case, it's going to be Q, Q1 and Q3. And when it's negative, it's Q2 and Q4. So we'll go through the same procedure here. So uh, let's do the positive one first. Tangent of x equals positive the square root of 3. So step one is to figure out the quadrants. All students take calculus for the tangent, positive in the first, because they're all positive in the first, positive in the third, negative in the second, fourth. So that means for this one, the solutions are q1 and q2. Now we're going to calculate the reference angle, which is going to be good for all of the, whether it's negative the square root of 3 or positive the square root of 3, because the reference angle is the inverse tangent of the absolute value of the right-hand side, which is, in this case, positive, so it stays positive. So if you have your calculator in radians, you do the inverse tangent of the square root of 3, you get 1.047 radians. But we multiply and divide by pi. So we take 1.047 divided by do this again. Inverse tangent of the square root of 3. Okay, that's 1.047. And we divide by pi. So we get 0 0.333 pi, which is pi over 3. So that's my reference angle. So the third step is to find the solutions. In this case, I have a quadrant 1 solution and a quadrant 3 solution. So my first quadrant says the solution is equal to the reference angle. So it's pi over 3. And my third quadrant solution says it's theta equals pi plus theta prime, the reference angle. So that's pi plus pi over 3. So we got, in this case, we got thirds. So it's 3 pi over 3 plus 1 pi over 3. That's 4 pi over 3. So that's my second quadrant solution. So that went along with the tangent of x equals positive the square root of 3. If I look at, and let's go write those down while we're, while we're busy, while we have them. So we have pi over 3. We have um, the second quadrant solution was 
4 pi over 3, or third quadrant solutions, 4 pi over 3. So we just need the second and fourth quadrant solutions. So for the tangent of x equals minus the square root of 3, theta prime is still equal to pi over 3, because when we take the inverse tangent here, we do the absolute value. So when we take the absolute value of negative the square root of 3, we'll end up with positive the square root of 3. So the reference angle we already know. And um, so our second quadrant solution, theta is equal to, did I do, did I do the second quadrant? So, yeah, right. third quadrant. OK, theta, second quadrant is pi plus the reference angle. So we have pi plus pi over 3. Oh, I'm sorry. Minus second quadrant. So we got 3 pi over 3 minus 1 pi over 3 gives us 2 pi over 3. And the fourth quadrant solution, is, theta is equal to 2 pi minus the reference angle. So we get 2 pi minus pi over 3. Okay, so we now we convert this to thirds. 6 pi over 3 minus 1 pi over 3 is 5 pi over 3. So my third quad, second quadrant solution is 2 pi over 3. My fourth quadrant solution is 5 pi over 3. So these are the eight solutions that I have. And let's, let's plot this thing, the original equation. Here it is. Okay. So we've got 3 times tangent of x squared minus 1, and then times tangent of x squared minus 3. And uh, I think that should be right. And let's go from 0 to 2 pi instead of from negative. So we graph it, and there we go. So um, let's zoom out in the y direction a little bit. Okay, so that's what the function looks like. You've got a vertical asymptote it looks like here at 0.5. So here is uh, pi over 6. Here we have pi over 3. Here we have 2 pi over 3. Here we have 5 pi over 6. 0.84. Here we have whatever the next one was. You see we have eight solutions where the function equals zero. Now, to find all the solutions, we just take the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, which are 6 of them, and you just add n times, um, hmm. yeah, it's interesting. So one, this is, this is kind of a compact form, uh, and this, this works because it's tangent. Even though, if I took, if I go back here and I just make all of these equal to, um, say, x or theta, whatever it was, x equals pi over 6 plus n times 2 pi. So the next one would be 2 pi plus pi over 6, which would be 13 pi over 6. But it'll turn out that you you can do du you duplicate things here. You have m more than one equation. So what what I'm saying here is if you if you're doing the tangent function because of the way it repeats itself, the symmetry associated with the tangent function, you can take your first and second quadrant solutions. You don't have to do this sec third and fourth quadrant solutions and just add n times pi. 
and even there you see there's some duplication well no that's so you get pi over six and then you'd add pi which would give you seven pi over six here you'd have pi over three plus pi which would be four pi over three so and you can only do that with the tangent function but if you just follow the rules and took these eight solutions which are in all four quadrants and added n times two pi you'd still get you'd still cover all the points and and if you do that that's fine because then it matches up with what you do for sine and cosine it's just the way that the the tangents um, you know in, in the case of a the tangent function you have this kind of repetitive situation you know where so you have in a period you have two repeats and so the distance here is between adjacent things is pi whereas when you deal with the sine and the cosine let's say the sine function like this you know you have to go you can't just go pi if you went pi you don't here it's not on the curve you have to go all full two pi so so I guess yeah thinking back we could have instead of for the tangent we could do the first and second quadrant solutions and then use this multiples of n multiples of pi instead of 2 pi. The problem there, of course, would be that if you wanted to just list all of the solutions between 0 and 2 pi, you'd still have to go through what I did anyway. Or, or, do, or you could take the values when n equals 0 and the values when n equals 1. And that's the situation. So, you know, this, these are connected. These are different by pi. This one's different by pi. This one's different by pi. These are different by pi. These are all multiples of pi. Okay, so we got a couple more here. Just look at what I got. Okay. Yeah, this is going to be a longer lecture, so you might want to do this in, in multiple, in multiple uh, shots. Yeah, and here's here's kind of the rule for sine, cosine, cosecant, cotangent. You take the solutions in all four quadrants and add n times two pi or two pi times n. For the tangent, cotangent, you take solutions in the first and second quadrants and add n times pi. Okay, now this one, you know, we don't have anything. We don't have anything that says sine of x equals something cosine of x. We got this. Um, expression so this is where you have to do a little bit of using identities and simplification you need to be able to write this as the sine equals something cosine equals something tangent equals something so what I would do I think in this case so is if you have two terms a lot of times the best thing to do is to to move one of the terms to the other side like that and then I probably would uh, I would probably rewrite the cosecant as one over the sine there and then I could multiply both sides by the sine so I get 2 sine square root of x equals negative 1 and the problem I have here is this does not have any solutions because if I take the, try to take a square root here to get the answer I can't take the square root of a negative number and if, if I plot this function here I will get probably a function that never intersects the x-axis so you know sometimes you may not have a solution let's see what the, what was the function again 2 sine x plus cosecant x and so I'm plotting y equals that and the solutions to this equation are when y is is crosses the y-axis and you see that I don't get anything. There's no x-intercept, so there's no solutions to that equation. 
So let's let's see what we do if, if it wasn't. Let's see if it was two sine x minus cosine cosecant. So if I had two sine x minus the cosecant of x equals zero. So again, I would add in this case of I would add the cosecant to both sides. So this be negative becomes positive. Rewrite the uh, cosecant as one over the sine. Cross multiply, you get two sine squared of x equals one. Divide by two sine squared of x equals one half. And then you take the square root. So the square root of sine squared is sine. Here you get plus or minus the square root of one half, which is plus or minus the square root of one over the square root of two which is plus or minus 1 divided by the square root of 2. And if you multiply and divide by the square root of 2, you'll get plus or minus the square root of 2 over 2. So now, after you've done all that stuff, now we finally have the equation that we can, we can deal with. Sine of x equals plus the square root of 2 over 2, and the sine of x equals minus the square root of 2 over 2. Now you know these are going to be like pi over 4 in the first, second, third quadrants. But let's let's just do each one of these separately and go through the procedure. Sine of x equals positive the square root of 2 over 2. Okay, step number 2. Step number 1. Which quadrants? So which quadrants are those? Is the... So when it says which, qua which quadrants are the sine positive. So that's what we're asking. All students take calculus. Sine. Positive in the first quadrant. They're all positive. Positive in the second quadrant. Negative in the third. Negative in the fourth. So for this one, the solutions are in the first quadrant and the second quadrant. Um, so let's write that down. So for the square root of 2 over 2, uh, negative the square root of 2 over 2, it's going to be quadrants 3 and 4. So that's, we've got a solution in each quadrant. So once you have that, once you've figured out the quadrants, we'll figure out the reference angle. And because they're the same magnitude, just different signs, we can we know the reference angle is going to be the is going to be the um, same for all of them. So we take the inverse sine of the absolute value of the square root of two over two, which is also equal to the inverse sine of the absolute value of negative the square root of 2 over 2. So that's just showing you that you get the same answer for all of these four cases. So we do the inverse sine of the square root of 2 divided by 2. And you get the reference angle equals 0 0.7854 radians. So you divide by pi. And we get 0 0.25 pi radians, which is pi over 4 radians. So that's my reference angle. So step 3 is to calculate the solutions based on the quadrants. Quadrant 1 solution is the reference angle, pi over 4. Quadrant 2 solution, which goes along with this plus value, is equal to pi minus the reference angle. So you get pi minus pi over 4, which is 3 pi over 4. 1 minus a quarter is 3 fourths. So those are those two are associated with plus the square root of 2 over 2. And then you have the third and fourth quadrant solutions, which are associated with minus the square root of 2 over 2. 
So the third quadrant solution is pi plus the reference angle. So it's pi plus pi over 4. 4 pi over 4 plus 1 pi over 4 is 5 pi over 4. And the fourth quadrant solution is 2 pi minus the reference angle. So you get 2 pi minus pi over 4. So in terms of fourths, 2 pi is 8 pi over 4. 8 pi minus 1, 7 pi over 4. So those are my those are my four solutions between 0 and 2 pi. So we could say uh, between 0, I guess we're using theta here. Were we using theta? Maybe we're using x, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Theta, 2 pi. There are four solutions. Oh, let's go back to the original equation, which was 2 sine x minus cosecant x. 2 sine x minus cosecant x equals 0. Between these has 4 solutions. Theta equal, um, it was x. Sorry about that. x equals pi over 4. x equals 3 pi over 4. x equals 5 pi over 4. And x equals 7 pi over 4. For x between negative infinity, positive infinity, x equals pi over 4 plus 2 pi times n. x equals 3 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n. x equals 3 pi, 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n. And x equals 7 pi over 4 plus 2 pi n. Now, in this case, and that's that's from n goes from negative infinity to positive infinity by integers. And um, but you could also notice these are all equally spaced, and that only happens when they're at the quarter points. So this is a kind of a unique situation. But just you could. Just say it's pi over 4 plus pi over 2 n. Combine all these into 1, just saying it's pi over 4 um, plus pi over 2 times n. So you can see if when n equals 1, you get pi over 4 plus pi over 2, which would be 3 pi over 4. And if n is 2, you get that one. If n is 3, you get that one. n is 4, you get the next one that's there. So. If you did this, that would be fine. You just got to do a lot of these problems to see that sometimes. OK, so let's plot the function now. So it's, it's the same function I had before, except it's minus the cosecant. And there we go. And we should see four intersections. Here we are, pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, 7 pi over 4. And if we expand it out to be like 8 pi instead of 2 pi. You just see it going over and over and repeat, repeat. So this would be the first four solutions, second four solutions, third four solutions, third fourth solutions, five four. Okay, next one, again, we've, we've not solved to the point where we have tangent equals something or secant equals something. So in this case, what you'd have to do first is you'd have to uh, replace probably the secant squared using the Pythagorean identity involving the secant tangent. So and that way, if I replace this with something involving tangent, then the two tangent terms can be combined together and the two co constant terms can be combined together. So the uh, if you look in your book, the Pythagorean identity involving the secant and the tangent is this. 
So I can plug in 1 plus tangent squared of x for secant squared. Then I have tangent squared minus 3 equals 0. Then I've got, uh, multiply this out, I've got 2 plus 2 tangent squared x plus tangent squared x minus 3 equals 0. 2 plus 1 gives me 3 tangent squared x. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Add 1 to both sides. Divide by 3. Take the square root. Oh, take the square root. So you get the square root of 1 third, which is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. Square root of 3 is square root of 3. Multiply and divide by the square root of 3. You get the square root of 3 over 3. Plus or minus. Forgot the plus or minus part. Plus or minus. Take the square root. It's plus or minus. So we get the tangent of x is plus or minus the square root of 3 over 3. So we got two parts here. But again, it's basically when you have plus or minus, you get all four quadrants. So you get tangent of x equals plus the square root of 3 over 3. You got the tangent of x equals minus the square root of 3 over 3. So from here, all students take calculus, plus, plus, minus, minus. So they're all positive in the first quadrant. Tangent's positive in the third quadrant. They're negative in the other quadrants. So this one is going to have a first quadrant and third quadrant. And this one is going to be the second quadrant and the fourth quadrant. So that's step one, figure out the quadrants. Step two is the same for both of them because to find the reference angle, you're going to take the inverse tangent of the absolute value of either that. So that's, that's for the left situation. That's also equal to the inverse tangent of the absolute value of negative the square root of 3 over 3. So these are going to give you the same results. So they give you the same reference angle. So we take the inverse tangent. Inverse tangent of the square root of 3 divided by 3. Close the parenthesis. We get 0 0.5236 radians. Multiply and divide by pi. So we're actually just going to divide by pi and we get 0 0.166 pi, which is pi over 6. Okay, so that's the reference angle for every one of these solutions. Now, remember the tangent, all we have to do is get the first and second quadrant solutions, and then we can add in pi. So let's do that. Most of the time we deal with sines and cosines, so I forgot about this tangent specialty, special situation. So the quadrant one solution, which goes along with this, theta is just theta prime. So the first quadrant solution is pi over 6. The second quadrant solution, which goes with this one, theta equals pi minus theta prime. So we get pi minus pi over 6. 6 pi over 6 minus 1 pi over 6 is 5 pi over 6. So that's my first and second quadrant solutions. If I if I wanted the third quadrant solution, uh, I'd add pi to this. If I want the fourth solution, I add pi to this. But my, so this is between um, and again, I used theta. Sorry about that. Here, going between 0 and pi, first and second quadrant solutions. Um, you know, 
third quadrant solution. I'm just going to do these. We wouldn't necessarily need these if we're not, but I'm just going to show you if you wanted to get those extra two, you'd have pi plus theta prime, which is going to be pi plus pi over 6, which is 7 pi over 6, which is the same as just adding pi to that one. And my fourth quadrant solution is 2 pi minus pi theta prime. So you get 2 pi minus pi over 6, which is, so this is 12 minus 1, 11 pi over 6, which is the same as that if I add, if I add pi to this, 6 pi over 6 plus 5 pi over 6 equals 11 pi over 6. So that's, that's kind of why we don't need to do the second and third quadrant solutions. So the final answer here for all angles, theta equals the first quadrant solution, 5 or 6, plus n pi instead of 2. And the other solution is 5 pi over 6 plus n times pi, where n goes from between negative infinity positive infinity. So that's that answer. And uh, let's, let's plot this thing. So what did we have? Originally it was secant squared x. And let's go from 0 to 2 pi instead of Okay, so you get 2 secant of x squared plus tangent tangent of x squared minus 3. So that's the function. And we should have four intercepts. Which you do? 1, 2, 3, 4. The first one is pi over 6. The second one is 5 pi over 6, 7 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6. So we did it again. Okay, next one, use a graph to solve. So here, there, to solve this graph, you could, you could plot the function, the two functions separately and find the points of intersection, or you can plot, well, that's what actually I'm doing here, or you could plot this function and just find the x-intercept. So um, what I've done here is I've plotted two sine of x and cosine of x, actually negative cosine of x. So you got to move one to one side. So you have two sine of x. When does that equal negative the cosine of x? It's when they intersect. And if you go with your cursor, and look, you'll get 85.85 pi and 1.85 pi, which are which are not uh, angles that are unit circle. So we'll, we'll solve this thing analytically, which is done down here. So you know, without the unit circle, we wouldn't be able to solve these. But the procedure we've learned, we don't need to use the we don't use the unit circle. So the first thing we do is we take the equation. And we need to get it so that it says sine equals something, cosine equals something, or tangent equals something. Here we have both sine and cosine. But if we take the cosine, move it to the other side, it becomes negative cosine. Divide both sides by the cosine. You'll get 2 sine divided by the cosine. Cosine divided by cosine is 1, so you get negative 1. Divide both sides by 2, you get tangent of x equals negative 1 half. So the original equation was a function of sine and cosine, but we were able to reduce that to a single um, equation. Now once we have that, first step is to find the quadrant. And because it's because it's um, the tangent, we only have to find the solution in quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. So the tangent is positive in the first quadrant, negative in the second quadrant. So we know that our of the two quadrants, one and two, the solutions in quadrant two. Then you can find the reference angle. So we take the inverse tangent of the absolute value 
of negative one half, which is positive one half. So you pull the, plug that in your calculator. Make sure either mode is in degrees or radians. You get 0.4636 radians. Divide this by pi. You get 0.1475 pi. So that's my reference angle. Then you can use this reference angle to get the second quadrant solution. So the second quadrant solution is always pi minus the reference angle. So you have 1 pi minus 0.1475 pi. So 1 minus 0.475 is 0.8525 pi. And if we go back up to the graph here, you'll see we have 0.85 pi is that point of intersection. And because it's tangent to get the, the next solution, we just add pi to this. So 1 plus 0.85 is 1.85. And that's you know one of the reasons we changed this to some multiples of pi, because the, the arithmetic here is a lot easier if it's some ratio of pi, even when it's not things that are on the unit circle. Because we have 1 minus 0.1475, which some people could do in their head. You could definitely add 1 to, you know, 1 added onto this is 1.825 pi. So my solutions are, all my solutions for n equals from negative infinity to positive infinity are my first, second quadrant solution, which is the only solution that I have in the first and second quadrant, plus n times pi. And when n equals 1, I get my fourth quadrant solution. Actually, that's my, yeah, is that my fourth quadrant solution? Yeah. If we go back up to this graph, this is in the fourth quadrant. Here's first quadrants from here to here, second quadrants from there to there, third quadrants from there to there, fourth quadrant. Okay, so that's all the examples of just single angle. Single angle meaning the argument of the trig function is just x. But sometimes you have something that's not just x, it's 2x or 2 theta. So the way you do it is very similar to what you do for single angle is you just but what you do is you you define a kind of a intermediate angle to help you solve the problem so you just solve it exactly the same. So once we have solved this for the sine without any coefficients in front of it just sine by itself we get the sine of 2 theta is equal to, is equal to a half at that point, we define another variable, which I use alpha. So we say alpha is equal to 2 theta. And we look for the solutions where alpha is between 0 and 2 pi. So we still, for alpha, we find the solutions from 0 to 2 pi. And then we can find the, uh, once we find the solutions for alpha, then we can just divide everything by 2 to find the solutions um, for theta, because what we would do is, for theta, we would go between 0 um, and just pi, because if you have theta equal pi, alpha is 2 pi, so you can go, you know, the alpha is the argument. So we're going to do this. We're going to solve it for this with alpha. So instead of solving the equation of the sine of 2 theta equals a half, we're going, to, we're going to solve the problem sine of alpha equals 1 half. So let's not worry about theta until we've solved this whole thing. And then we'll, we'll make a substitution back in. So step one, quadrant. Okay, all students take calculus, the sine, positive in the first quadrant, positive in the second quadrant, negative in the third and fourth quadrant. So we have a quadrant one and a quadrant two solution. Okay, next, find the reference angle. And this is alpha, not theta. So I'll say theta prime is the uh, inverse sine 
of the absolute value of one half. It's already one half, so it's just going to be the inverse sine of a half. Make sure your calculator is in radians. So you have the inverse sine of 0.5. So you get 0 0.5236 radians. And you divide by pi. And you'll get 0 0.166 pi radians, which is pi over 6. So alpha prime is pi over 6 radians. Now we, we find the two solutions between 0 and 2 pi for alpha. So our quadrant 1 solution, alpha equals alpha prime, which is pi over 6. Uh, my second quadrant solution is alpha equals pi minus alpha prime. So you have pi minus pi over 6, which is 5 pi over 6. So if I want to find all my solutions here, all my solutions are going to be this first quadrant solution. So I take alpha is equal to pi over 6 plus 2 pi n. And my second solution is going to be 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n. This is the additional step. Theta equals alpha, well, alpha equals theta over 2 theta. So alpha equals 2 theta, or theta equals alpha divided by 2. I actually want to, I want to use this one, so I'm going to plug that in. So I get 2 theta equals pi over 6 plus 2 pi, 2 pi n, or theta equals pi over 12 plus pi n. And my second solution is 2 theta equals 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n, because alpha was equal to 5 pi over 6 plus 2 pi n. So you divide everything by 2, and you get 5 pi over 12 plus pi times n. So that's those are the two solutions. So what you end up with is uh, when let's say an n goes from negative infinity to positive infinity like that. So let's do n equals 1, I mean n equals 0, n equals 0, that'll give you theta is equal to pi over 12, and that's the first equation, and the second equation you'll get 5 pi over 12. And remember a twelfth, put this in decimal form, this is uh, 0 0.8083 pi. If you take 5 divided by 12, that's 0 0.416 pi. So those are those are both in the first quadrant. Then you'd have n equals 1. So you have theta is equal to pi over 12 plus pi times 1. So that's pi plus pi over 12. That's 13 pi over 12. If you do the decimals, 13 divided by 12, that's 1.083 pi. And the second one is 5 pi over 12 plus pi. So 12 pi over 12 plus 5 pi over 12 is 17 pi over 12. If you take 17 divided by 12, you get 1.416 pi. Okay, now the reason I did this is these are the solutions between 0 and 2 pi. Normally you'd have only four, two solutions between 0 and 2 pi, but because
because we are have this two theta alpha equals two theta, you get twice as many solutions because the the function is compressed. Remember the coefficient in front of here. If we go back all the way to this thing, the coefficient in front of theta is the period, and so our period is half, and so everything gets squished horizontally. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to plot this function y equals 2 sine 2x minus 1 and we're going to look for the points of intersection and they should be equal to what we came up with the answer if I did it right so you have 2 sine of 2x minus 1 so that's y we're going to go from 0 to 2 pi. We're going to graph it and we're going to zoom in a little bit in the x, uh, zoom in in the y direction. So you can see we have one, two, three, four solutions. Let's go get those solutions. So here they are. Let's squish this up a little further so we can see everything. So this first intersection is 0 0.09 pi, which is corresponds. If I zoom in on this thing, it should be 0.083. There you go. Um, I'm just rescaling this thing. Okay, the next one is around uh, 0.42 pi. That's that one. This one is 1.08 pi, which is that one. And the last one is going to be 1.46 pi. 1.46 pi. Okay, so you see that that is correct. Oh, here's the picture. Okay, so. But the key thing is that these are not pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. They are other ones, and that's this is a more general case of what you need to do. Let's see where I am on my. Must be getting pretty close to the end. Yeah. Okay. Good. Two more problems. Okay. Here we have another one of these multiple angle solution situations. So we've got 3 theta instead of just theta. So we go through the same procedure. We'd have tangent squared of 3 theta equals 3. Add 2 to both sides. I mean add 3 to both sides. And uh, then you'd have that um, you take the square root, so you get the tangent of 3 theta equals plus or minus the square root of 3. So what we do is we say alpha is equal to 3 theta. And we'll come back to that, but once, we've, once we have that defined, we can rewrite this as the tangent of alpha equals plus or minus the square root of 3. So, step one, quadrant. Well, in this case, you know, we've got two, two cases. We've got the tangent of alpha equals plus the square root of 3, and we've got the tangent of alpha equals minus the square root of 3. So, all students take calculus, tangent, positive in the first quadrant, positive in the third quadrant, negative in the second and fourth. So, from this equation we're going to get the two positive quadrants which are q1 and q3 and from this one we'll get q2 and q4. Now because this is the tangent we really only need to get the first and second quadrant solutions and then we're going to add n pi to it. So so now we need to figure out the reference angle, which is going to be the same for all of these because of the fact they're, they're just squared 3, but it's plus or minus. So the reference angle is going to be the inverse tangent 
of the absolute value of the square root of 3, which is also the inverse tangent of the absolute value of negative the square root of 3. So the whole idea here is that the reference angle is the same for both parts. So we get our calculator out, make sure it's in radians, do the inverse tangent of the square root of 3, and we get the reference angle is 1.0472 radians. Divide by pi, multiply by pi. So what we actually do is we divide 1.047 by pi, and I get 0.333 pi. which is equal to pi over 3. So that's my reference angle. And since for the tangent, I only need the first and second quadrant, so step 3 is to find the solutions. My first quadrant solution is equal to, and I, I should have used alpha here. I apologize for that. So it's all alpha. I get kind of used to doing theta, but... Okay, alpha, 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 alpha. Okay, so my Q1 solution is alpha is equal to alpha prime. So alpha is equal to pi over 3. Uh, my second quadrant solution, which goes with the minus the square root of 3, that's going to be the second quadrant solution, alpha is equal to pi minus alpha prime. So you get pi minus pi over 3, which is 2 pi over 3. So that's my first quadrant, my second quadrant solution. So to find the solutions for all angles, alpha is going to be equal to pi over 3, the first quadrant solution, plus n times pi. Not 2 pi n, because that, that's true for all the other ones except cotangent. And then the second quadrant solution is 2 pi over 3 plus n times pi. Um, so that's alpha, but this is where the multiple angle thing is. Alpha equals 3 theta. So I plug in, so this is step 5, to make it multiple angle, you get 3 theta equals alpha, and alpha is pi over 3 plus n pi. Or theta, divide everything by 3, you get pi over 9 plus n pi over 3. And the second one, we say 3 theta equals alpha, which is also 2 pi over 3 plus n pi over 3. No. Getting ahead of myself here. 2 pi over 3 plus n pi. So if I solve for theta, theta is equal to 2 pi over 9 plus n pi over 3, or pi over 3 times n. Now, you know, our original, in terms of alpha, we actually have four solutions between 0 and 2 pi. But because we have this 3 theta, we actually end up with four solutions times 3. We have 12 solutions between 0 and um, 2 pi. So let's, do, let's just show that's true. So let's go back to the original equation here. Tangent squared of 3 theta minus 3. OK. So we're going from 0 to 2 pi. Um, click right here. So we're going from 0 to 2 pi, and we have the tangent of 3x instead of x squared. Tangent of 3x squared, which is tangent squared of 3x, minus 3. So that's y equals tangent of 3x squared. And we should see 12 intersections. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 
the first intersection is at 0.11 pi approximately. So if we go to our solutions here, so when when n equals 0, we get theta equals pi over 9. And if we do that, we get pi divided by 9 is That's not what I got. Okay, what did I do wrong here? Oh, no, that's not right. So, yeah, so that's one ninth pi, which is, if you take one ninth, one ninth, you get 0 0.11 pi. So if we go to our graph, this first intersection is 0.11 pi. Okay, the next solution, the other n equals zero solution is is two pi over nine, so that's two ninths pi, which is going to be zero point two two pi, since two ninths is twice one ninth. So I go here, and the next one is point two two pi. Okay, so that's the first two solutions. Then we go to n equals one, which would be theta equals um, pi over nine plus 1 times pi over 3. So you got uh, you got 1 ninth plus 3 ninths, so that's 4 ninths, 4 ninths pi. Okay, pi over 9 is 1 ninths pi. Here, pi over 3 is 3 pi over 9. So 1 plus 3 is 4. 4 ninths, well, if, if 1 ninth is 0.111, then 4 ninths is going to be 0 0.44 pi. So we go to the graph, look at the next one, and it should say 0.44 pi. And then finally, when n equals 1, I use it for the second equation, we'll get uh, 2 pi over 9 plus pi over 3, which is 2 ninths plus 3 ninths is going to be 5 ninths, 5 ninths pi, which is going to be 0 0.55 pi, because these are 0.11. Actually, it's 0 0.11111.22222222 blah blah blah. So the next one should be 0 0.55. So here we are, 0 0.55. So you see it worked out. Okay, and then we have one, one word problem here. Okay, so this is the last problem, which I've worked through wrong. I forgot to convert yards to feet, so. Basically, what you do, and we'll fix these, so don't don't write them yet. We'll go through them here. So the range is not a thousand feet; it's a thousand yards, which is three thousand feet. So uh, what we're trying to do is solve for theta, given the range, the initial velocity, this constant, which is the acceleration due to gravity. So we plug everything in. Our unknown is, is theta. So if we fix the 3,000 here, so this becomes 3,000 instead of 1,000. So we get 0 0.0222 times 3, which is 0 0.0666. And so 2 theta equals 0 0.666. This is, this is where I found out I did my uh, well, I thought I'd confirmed I did it right, but I still had the units wrong, so we'll, we'll erase that. Um, so what we do is we set alpha equal to 2 theta, and that is equal to 0 0.666. So because this is positive and because of the uh, fact that the solution is going to be in the first quadrant because it's going to be a small angle, uh, we, we know that the reference angle is going to be equal to the angle. So the reference angle is the inverse sign of the absolute value of our unknown, which we're solving doing alpha, and then we'll divide by 2 to get, to get theta. So we take the inverse sign of 0 0.0666, and we get 3.3. 
3.82 degrees. That's the reference angle, which is also equal to the angle. And so our final solution is going to be equal to alpha divided by 2, 3.82 divided by 2, which is going to be, um, which gives us theta is equal to 1.9 degrees. So that's the solution. I think that's it for the chapter. So you've got your homework to do now, so it'll look at the example problems.